The views and content expressed on the following program are provided solely for informational and entertainment purposes. They do not constitute legal advice. A podcast is not a substitute for retaining a competent, licensed attorney to advise you on your specific legal situation. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. It is time for Break the Business, where we empower indie creators and have some fun along the way. I'm Ryan Carella, and it is a pleasure to have you here this week. And boy, are we going to have some fun along the way this week, viewers and listeners. The industry's moving too fast. It's one of those weeks where the industry's just moving too fast again, and I can't keep up. And I really mean it this week, folks, because not five minutes before we go live on air, I find out that the SAG after strike is apparently over. So we're all pretty thrilled about that. Uh, as we record this on November 8th at 3 a.m. Eastern time, November 9th, the actors are back to work. SAG AFTRA is back to work, which is really good because I can only binge watch old episodes of Star Trek for so long. We need new material, and it sounds like we're getting back out there. I look forward to seeing what the terms of the tentative agreement are. There were so many sticking points, so many places where it seemed like the AMPTP and the actors were miles apart. So I'd love to see how they brought that together, what they did about restreaming residuals, what they did about AI. Make no mistake, we're going to be covering this at great painstaking length throughout the weeks. But right now, we don't know a damn thing, so we have to talk about other stuff this week. But we got so much to talk about, let me tell you. Our guest coming up in the second segment, we're going to be joined by Live Music Society Executive Director Kat Henry, an amazing nonprofit devoted to supporting small independent venues all over the country. Amazing cause. Excited to talk to her about the incredible work that that organization does. But even before we get into any of that, I want to talk about something that kind of blows my mind that's happening a 10 minute drive from my house. You know, I always love any story that I don't have to go a long way to research. And not only does it, did this happen 10 minutes from my house, it happened at basically my place of work. I teach at the university of Miami. And so, uh, this, uh, happened at my alma mater, the place where I, I teach as a lecturer. And just so you all know, okay. Uh, whenever, Anything happens with Taylor Swift in the world, I find out about it, not just because I have a Taylor Swift Google alert and not just because all of my news feeds tell me everything that Taylor Swift does at any given moment, but I also know everything because you loyal viewers and listeners will text, tweet, post, etc. everything that Taylor Swift does so or anything involving Taylor Swift. So when news comes out that the University of Miami School of Law has a course at its law school completely dedicated to Taylor Swift and intellectual property law. Yeah, every single one of you texted me about it. My phone was inundated. Yes, I heard the news about the Taylor Swift course. For those of you who did not hear the news, let me tell you about this. This is pretty wild, okay? There's a class going on right now at the University of Miami School of Law. I didn't go to UM Law, but like a thousand of my family members did. So I feel like I got a degree from there through osmosis. Um, this class started in October. I believe it's a seven week class going on this semester. And the title of this class, uh, Chef's Kiss, the title of this class is Intellectual Property Law Through the Lens of Taylor Swift. Now, this is a course title I can get behind. I have never been excited about a law school course title, right? Nothing about the phrase civil procedure uh, makes me giddy. But you're telling me that there is a class out there called intellectual property through the lens of Taylor Swift. I want to audit that class tomorrow. I am so disappointed that class didn't exist when I was in law school. So naturally, the first thing I want to do is say, I got to talk to this professor. I need to talk to the pedagogical genius who dreamed up this marvelous course and has uh, bestowed it upon the grateful students of the law school of the fine institution that is the University of Miami. 
So you know what? Let's do that. Joining us on Break the Business right now, professor at the University of Miami School of Law and founder of Gyrum Law, based in Chicago and Miami and a bunch of other cities. Joining us right now on the program, we have Vivek Gyrum here on Break the Business. Hello, Vivek. Hey, how you doing, Ryan? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show. I you know, am we're, we're practically neighbors. I know this is this is terrific. I frankly, I am flabbergasted that something as amazing as your Taylor Swift course could happen in my backyard, and I got to hear about it through Billboard magazine and a bunch of viewers and listeners texting me. This is this is I have so many questions, Vivek. Okay. Um, because you might know this, not know this from this program. I don't know if you're a loyal listener or anything, but we're kind of obsessed with T Swift around here. Okay. Um, and okay. so this speaks to I all of us. That. All right. Um, and so I, the first thing I have to know is how do you pitch a course like this to the dean of the University of Miami School of Law? Uh, I mean, do you do you almost do you have to come in and like pretend like you're joking just in case like he thinks that he doesn't like it? And you can be like, oh no, I was just kidding. I would never start a law school course about Taylor Swift. Or are you like completely 100% sincere? Like, did he laugh at you or was he like, yes, you have my support? <laughs> so um, so I've been teaching at, at the UM School of Law for like eight years now. And most of my courses are s- somewhat different than what you would get, you know, from, from the more traditional uh, law school professors. But it's sort of expected to be that way because I primarily teach in this program that started in 2016, which is a sort of specialized LLM and also, you know, some, some JDs take these courses in entertainment, sports, and, um, and, and the arts. And so, uh, you know, like the program itself is geared towards getting these students ready to like practice in like the real world very quickly. And so there is this, you know, emphasis on like being hyper relevant and contemporary, like with the, with the topics that, that are taught. So teaching the doctrine, yes, but then like showing them how it will apply in the entertainment and sports industry, like, you know, upon them sort of graduating. So like in that regard, the, the class probably already is starting to make a little bit more sense to maybe you and the listeners, but I will tell you, I didn't have an issue with this one. But early on, you know, I remember teaching a couple of early kind of courses, um, you know, not really as like maybe um, sort of like pop culture as this one, but but that I did have to sort of explain myself and show the sort of um, administration that like, listen, they're, they're not only going to learn like everything that they would in like a more traditional course. I actually think they're going to learn why it's relevant to like their career and like be able to apply it a little bit more effectively um, than maybe another case. Because for example, right, just as one quick example, right, what is the seminal case uh, on copyright law that you read in law school that tells us that sort of like facts are, are not copyrightable, right? It's Feist, which comes from the yellow pages. Like no <laughs> in my class even knows what a yellow pages is or what yellow pages were, right? But they all know Taylor Swift. Right. And they all know her very well. So understanding these principles of copyright law, like through the lens of her career and her music and her songwriting, I think connects with them um, pretty well. It seems so wild to me that a 33 year old recording artist has already generated enough IP matters that you could fill a three credit law school course with them. And you probably still had some Taylor Swift IP law stuff that made the cutting room floor that you don't have time for. Can you speak to kind of her as an IP phenomenon and how she's been able to create a career that gave you enough stuff to teach about with copyright and trademark? Yeah, no, it it is wild. And you're absolutely right about that, Ryan. I think that that sentiment is probably one of the first ones I had as I was this sort of like almost jokingly like dreaming up this course in my head like it was about a year and a half or so ago i think probably around the time that she or somebody announced that like she was recording a new record that would be coming out you know uh, which ultimately was midnights and i had just recently you know in the in the few months prior to that um you know i'm, I'm a taylor swift fan i'm, I'm a, I'll, we'll do we can talk about that too i mean i'm in more of an i started as a 1989 kind of fan and then sort of found the rest of her catalog through that but I, I I will say, like, I had just read about the Evermore lawsuit where she was sued by a theme park 
uh, for trademark infringement. And, right, and, then I, and then I recalled the, the you know, they were saying, hey, she's coming out with a new album. I just read about this case. And then I'm thinking about all the re-recording, which was also like relatively fresh news uh, around that time. And I just thought to myself, like, wow, yeah, there, there's already just a few very interesting uh, intellectual property issues. And then I thought of uh, some back some more. And I'm like, wait, she was also sued for Shake It Off at least once. Ultimately, I learned it was twice, right? And then um, and then I also remember, I don't know if you remember this, Ryan, in about 2016, 17, she went on a bit of a trademark prosecution, um, you know, tear where she where she registered a bunch of lyrics as trademarks, which also was interesting from like a use in commerce standpoint. So, you know, I kind of started combing through the registry to see what she did with all these applications. And some of them she put to use, you know, I don't know if any of your listeners have the uh, this sick beat drum beats, uh, drumsticks, but uh, they're out there, um, you know, and 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 uh, I am a number of the other applications were abandoned. Right. Which um, makes some sense because she was a sort of early um, uh, sort of adopter of the celebrity trademark sort of phenomenon, which we've seen a lot of in the last decade, right? And um, so it kind of gave us, it gives you a good window into how celebrities oftentimes file sort of a litany of, uh, you know, 1B applications, like an intent to use yeah. application, right? And um, and then later abandon them. And so it was also interesting to see which ones she abandoned and which ones she actually, you know, tried to ultimately, you know, make a product or, or, or you know, uh, from, and so that, that anyway, so just even those handful of things I've just mentioned, the say shake it off lawsuits, the Evermore lawsuit, the trademark prosecution strategy, and the, uh, the, the, the Taylor's version re-recordings, just that is enough fodder probably for like an in, entire year, not even just a semester, you know? <laughs> and when I think about what must be the student body's reaction to your course, I'm just envisioning you trying to lecture to these students and you're having trouble getting your words out over just the pounding on the door of all of the students who want to get in, who couldn't get in off the wait list. I'm imagining it's like the Eras tour where there's just a bunch of people waiting in the parking lot outside of your class, uh, just listening to it, listening to your lecture over the PA system. It, you know, it, it, um, it, it, that's, you know, that, that, that is nice to think of, you know, it's nice to think about. I mean, it's not quite like that, but, um, but, you know, it is it is a great energy. You know, we, we, we listen to the music um, where it's relevant. Right. Like if you're we've listened to the the TLW song, we listen to Jesse Bram's song. Right. The, the, both of the plaintiffs and the copyright cases, um, you know, and and, and uh, you know, we, we, we listen to a couple tracks off Evermore. Um, and we also watch some videos, videos on the theme park Evermore. Right. So, I mean, you know, it, it is a it, it is a pretty engaging class in that way, um, you know. But it is like at the end of the day, it's also a really interesting intellectual property class. And, uh, you know, so it kind of cuts both ways. Like it, it's kind of I think it, it it's both satisfies the person who like just wants to kind of nerd out on some of this IP stuff. And there's plenty of those people in law school and, and there's some of those in in this class. But, um, yeah, for sure. There's like <laughs> several Swifties. And you like, got a wait list. I know it. I just know big wait list. No, right. Thank this, you. This was, this was a an extra. This was I've been there eight years. Um, I, I don't want to use like superlatives that'll like get me in trouble with the university, but from what I understand, like th this was like a, 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 there was an extraordinary wait list, um, <laughs> super passionate interest in this. And yeah, I mean, like, uh, there was a Miami Herald article uh, earlier this week that like, you know, um, definitely made the rounds and like, the, I, I have gotten so many notes from people all across the, the the school, not just the university, I'm sorry, not just the law school, you know? So it's, uh, it, it really does underscore though, how you sort of led with this whole thing, which is what I've been sort of telling family and friends when they're like, hey, how'd you, what's this all about, right? Which is, it really is not just a, a generational talent and, um, you know, sort of songwriter, but it's like, because others who you might sort of, throw into that, um, you know, category, right? Like a, a Michael Jackson or, you know, Madonna, Dolly Parton, um, you know, uh, you know, Paul McCartney, you know, any of these people, right? All of them existed before the internet. And this is an artist who, you know, I think has a lot of those qualities and characteristics and achievements, but is also pretty masterful 
in her ability to build really an unbelievable community online and around the world. And I think we are now really seeing the, the sort of results of the last 15 years of that. It is exciting to see, and it's really fun to chronicle the cool stuff she's doing in business and in art pretty much every week on this program. She's yeah. always given us something to <laughs> chat about. Now, as you noted in, in the beginning of our discussion, this class is sort of just your latest and kind of rebellious law school classes that you create and teach. You don't do, this ain't your granddaddy's uh, law school class that uh, Vivek Jairam is doing. But, and to me, that sort of parallels your approach to the law generally, your law firm, uh, Jerome Law, is a little rebellious. You're not, the, the way you're presenting your firm out there, when I look at your website, you're not trying to be the stuffy, white shoe, conservative law firm. You're doing things differently. Uh, you're not afraid to show a personality and to have your uh, other partners and associates and other employees show their personality. And it's refreshing to see as an attorney myself who would like to pr practice law more like that and less like the way that it's been done. Can you talk a little bit about your approach in that space? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, well thank you, Ryan. That that um, is very you know kind of you to say, and I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, we're definitely like, yeah, the rebels, like we're all kind of like misfits, I guess you could say, um, in a way. And, you know, for me, um, it is, it is, um, I, I think that's just a, a sort of representation in many ways of kind of who I am or who I kind of um, grew into being uh, over the years. You know, I, I started my career um, in, in big law. I did a clerkship for a judge and then I was in big law for a few years. And, you know, I, I made a lot of good friends, relationships, things like that, and, and still have the, a lot of those relationships. But for me, I really found the culture of law. I love the practice of law, but I found the culture of the legal industry to be very stuffy, very um, conservative. And this was like the early 2000s or the mid 2000s, I guess, by this point. And, you know, there was just a real um, sort of growing need I felt to, for, for representation of like, you know, the creatives and the creative class. And I felt like the way that the creative class, um, you know, which includes creative brands at the time, honestly, tech founders too, because they were also sort of breaking the mold back then, right? These were still um, relatively new entrepreneurs um, pursuing very new industries. So in many ways, they were lumped in with the artists and the musicians and like the sort of more creative kind of people because they weren't really in the sort of mainstream of corporate America. So I think, um, you know, anyway, so I, as I was sort of like kind of trying to find my way in the, in the law, I just reached a point where I'm like, this is just not for me. And uh, so I, you know, finally was talking actually to my then girlfriend, now, now wife, who I came home one day and was just like, yeah, this is like, it's just such a drag. I just don't like it like this. And I'm like, I'm just going to try to go out there and do it on my own. That was it. And I, all I said to myself is like the only real rule I was going to kind of, or the only real couple things I was going to use to guide this was I just want to completely be myself, you know, and, and not um, sort of play this role, which oftentimes I feel like in big law, there is sort of an encouragement to conceal who you actually are and sort of, you know, instead sort of present a personality that um, will appeal to clients or older partners or, or whatever the case might be. And so that anyway started sort of this journey, which began in 2009 by forming Jaram Law, where we just started working with really across um, art and culture, uh, fashion and uh, tech. Um, and at the time, just started working with a lot of friends, you know, and um, that you know, some of these uh, people turned into very sort of well-known artists running really cool, interesting fashion brands. And in other cases now, you know, running you know, some of the most well-known uh, tech companies out there. So, I mean, I think it was really a labor of love from the beginning and um, really tried to just sort of uh, build our firm to not sort of in the mold of any law firm out there or any um, legal service company or anything, but really to build it in the, the mold of the companies we wanted to work with, right? And so that's the sort of personality that I think you see come out, which is really, we're just sort of um, in, in some ways like an amalgamation of like all of the sort of super extraordinary creative people and companies 
we've had the pleasure of working with over the last 15 years. Your approach to practice allows you to meet your unique clients where they are and to, as you say, kind of become an amalgamation of all of your clients' personalities and approaches. And as an added bonus, it just sounds like a much more enjoyable way to practice law. <laughs> and so that that's a nice you, little you know, added it, plus. I, yeah, no, I'm, you know, I, I, I have to say, I mean, you know, we, we, we have a good time. We have, a, I think we have a pretty upbeat culture. Um, people seem to generally like each other and we do a lot of really, really interesting work that I think, um, oftentimes is like sort of uncharted territory in, in, in some ways when it comes to sort of new technology, like artificial intelligence or some years ago, blockchain, or, you know, towards the beginning of my career, like, you know, Napster and LimeWire and those kinds of things. So, I mean, um, I think, yeah, I, I think it is a sort of refreshing way to look at things. And that's sort of most of the people, Ryan, that, that work with us sort of have come from these other types of more white shoe places yeah. and have been drawn, I think, to us for really for that reason. And so, um, yeah. It's a terrific approach. Congratulations on this amazing course and congratulations on just everything you're doing with your practice. Uh, it seems like a, it seems like you're having a pretty fun time right now. Yeah, man. It's all good. Yeah, no, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on here. Um, look forward to finishing up the, uh, semester. And, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think the students have a few, few, few fun weeks ahead. Very cool. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Vivek Jairam on Break the Business. Producer Lauren, can I chat with you for a second? Can you pop in here? I don't know if you're busy Absolutely. getting our next guest ready. So, I mean, that's She's hanging cool, out back right? there. Way better. Cat <laughs> uh, Henry going to be joining us uh, just after the break here in about 10 minutes or so. And uh, I mean, I got an ear to ear smile. I mean, first of all, like, you know, the, the, I, I really enjoy practicing law. I love being a lawyer. And that's despite the fact that I did not particularly enjoy law school or the way that most other lawyers practice law. So when I see somebody like Vivek, who is kind of creating law school courses that make law school fun and is practicing law in a way that seems authentic and mm. uh, powerful and rebellious and client centered. I mean, that just puts a smile on my face, which is well, so cool. Because that's the next knock on wood, right? That's the next generation of lawyers that they're breeding. So if you get more instructors that are uh, teaching that way of thinking and that out of the box and breaking the norms and things like that, in theory, you're going to get lawyers that also think that way and expand on that. So that's exciting for the field, as it were. They're not all bookworms that are in a stuffy room studying and not talking to other people because they don't have to. Yeah. Now I don't know how locked tight <laughs> the Vaik's syllabus is and how much room he has for other things, but I want to start the process now of kind of needling this guy to see if I can get in there. Just what, you know, 30 minute guest lecture. I was going to say, you, you want to be a speaker in his class? Absolutely. Why didn't we bring this up here? I mean, the law school's just next door to the business school. I can pop over there, knock on the door, and talk for a little bit about how that 3LW copyright infringement suit was nonsense. Or just, you know, do 30 minutes on just why I love everything about Taylor Swift. I can find a way to make that uh, relate to the subject matter. You've what done a cool your research. course. I want to be a part of it. I, I liked the whole auditing theory because, you know, you have so much free time on your hand while you're teaching at 12 different places and running That's your right. own practice <laughs> and raising a child. But, you know, no, I'll bring not? the baby. Never too <laughs> early for the baby to learn about Hello. a transcendent figure like Taylor Swift. <laughs> Speaking of uh, ridiculous copyright infringement suits, Lauren, since we're kind of in this <sighs> subject area, um, I think we have a new Christmas holiday tradition. So when I when I when I birthed the aforementioned son, when I, my new son came into the world, well, you didn't birth him. But I okay. didn't do. I was I was I was but a, a humble spectator. Um, but when Nathan, my son came into the world, one of my first thoughts was like, oh, I think of all the wonderful Christmas traditions we're going to create. I thought of things like, oh, every year we're going to watch a Muppet Christmas Carol, which is the best of all the Christmas Carol movies. Fight me. 
Um, and maybe we'll do a yearly reading of how the Grinch stole Christmas while we drink oh. eggnog. I, I, I got ideas, but now I have a new one that I want to add to the list. Something that I'm pretty sure is going to become an annual holiday tradition. And that is the annual Vince Vance copyright complaint against Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. Let me... Let me cue that. Let me uh, give the viewers and listeners the background here. So on November 1st, about a week ago, as we record this musician, Andy Stone, better known as Vince Vance of the novelty pop group, Vince Vance and the Valiants. Ask your parents if you don't know who they are. (laughs) They have he has sued pop superstar Mariah Carey. You definitely know who she is for the humble sum of 20 million dollars, alleging that her iconic 1994 holiday classic. All I Want for Christmas is You is a ripoff of his 1990 song of the same name. In the 22-page complaint filed in California federal court, lawyers for Stone allege that the Mariah Carey classic is, quote, greater than a 50% clone of his client's original work. Fifty. Now, this might come as a surprise to any human being with ears because if you listen to... The transcendent All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey and this other All I Want for Christmas is You by Vince Vance and the Valiants. You will not think these songs to be, quote, a 50 percent clone of each other, but you'll be like, wow, the only two things that these things have in common are their title. This is a weak copyright claim. And if this copyright claim sounds familiar to you, viewers and listeners of this program, it's because this is not the first time we've talked about this on this show. Because no. this is not the first time that Vince Vance has sued Mariah Carey for infringement over this song. Last year, he filed a similar federal suit, which also claimed $20 million in damage. But he later withdrew his complaint, which I assume was because he realized how colossally absurd his claim was. But apparently, he did not realize that because he's back again. And I think this is just going to be an annual Christmas tradition. If at where- first you don't succeed. Right, where we're just going to keep getting a new Vince Vance complaint against Mariah Carey. And um, we, Lauren, do you have some of the audio of me talking about this last oh, year on yeah. this show? When this came up, we went back and had to go into the archives and we were like, didn't we already cover this subject? Are we reruns? Hold on a second. So here's a rerun for you all. We can bring this back up. <laughs> I can't believe this. But here's the thing, viewers and listeners. Other than the title, which both songs share, these two songs have zero in common. Bubkiss. No similar musical elements. No similar lyrical elements. Not even like a haters gonna hate throw in there. And never mind that both of the songs are 20 freaking years old and Vince Vance never thought to sue Mariah Carey before. That's what I thought too. It's like, yeah. why are you choosing now as your moment to do this? Exactly. <laughs> like this song, sense. we've been playing this song like from November to January in every department store <laughs> for 20 years. And now you decide, oh, I should probably sue Mariah Carey. <laughs> and none of that has stopped the lawyers representing Vince Vance from suing for deep breath, $20 million. <laughs> Wow. Now that's the clip from last year. Um, first thing worth noticing. Yep. Same amount. $20 million. He just must really love that amount. Wants to keep it in last is year's lawsuit and this year's like lawsuit. An attorney in cahoots with each other? Or is he like have to find new people to do this for him every year? Because the last guy was like, I was out. I think he's like, got a different attorney this time around because this year's complaint, the 2023 remix of the 2022 complaint is a lot stronger drafting. So I'm thinking like oh. he, he kind of, uh, you know, uh, traded up in his lawyering and got a, a stronger lawyer for this, but it's still a, a, an absurd, absurd claim. And it just, it frustrates me that, you know, it's still going at this again for another 20 million. Also, I noticed in that clip, Oh, is he I a commission? Miss- like, does he only get paid if he wins or like, <laughs> That, I mean, that is a typical collection in a copyright infringement suit. If you are the plaintiff as the uh, attorney gets a collection, the attorney in this case, I mean, I don't know the attorney, I but know. I would yeah. imagine, by the way, I would love to have Vince Vance's attorney on this show. I want to have this conversation, but I would imagine they're looking for the quick settlement. 
because, and they're probably looking at the Taylor Swift copyright infringement suit in which they were sued by some of the folks from 3LW or who wrote a song by 3LW because both the Taylor Swift song and the 3LW song had the phrase haters going to hate in it. Right. And the songs didn't really have any other similarity, but a court held that that was just enough similarity that a jury had to decide whether there was copyright infringement. And that's a kiss of death. If you're a, a defendant, you don't want a case to go to a jury because once it goes to a jury, anything can happen. So once it goes to a jury, if you're Taylor Swift, you're going to settle. And so she did settle. We don't know how much she settled for, but I'm assuming that there, uh, Mar Mariah Carey, or sorry, Vince Vance is hoping that's what's going to happen here, right? Is Mariah Carey is going to be like, I don't want to have to deal with this every Christmas. I don't want you. Christmas is a happy time for Mariah Carey. She makes a buttload of money in royalties. She doesn't want to have to think about this lawsuit every year. So there might be a settlement. And I think that's what the attorney and what Vince Vance is hoping for. And the thing that stinks and sort of suggests we, the problem we have with the law is they might get the settlement. They might get paid because, you know, this is a, you know, this is something that Mariah Carey doesn't want to have to deal with. And copyright law is such a uncertain area of law. You don't know what's going to happen if a case makes it to a jury that for the most part, the artist will just, you know, the, the defendant will just pay off the plaintiff because they're afraid of being the next Robin Thicke and blurred lines. And, well, and especially when, especially when you go back to it's less the artist and more the label on a lot of these things. And when your product isn't necessarily owned by you and the decision making powers go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We might smear your name a little bit, but like, we don't want to spend X amount of time on our attorneys and our energy and our time. It's not worth it. Let's just settle. And you're going, no, 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 no. That's my name. You're dragging through the mud by settling. Yeah. Like it's, it's rough. I, I don't like it. It's ugly. And we have seen some instances lately of artists who took that approach where they said, I don't want to settle. First of all, uh -huh. I don't want to open the floodgates, right? If if I settle here, that tells every other person out there who's looking for a payday, sue Mariah Carey, she'll settle. And so, you know, you you have artists like Ed Sheeran, right, who got uh, sued by the uh, some of the folks that wrote Let's Get It On because they said that his song Thinking Out Loud was similar. And he fought it. He could have settled out of court. Nobody yeah. would have known the amount. And instead, he fought it. He took it all the way to a jury. It was probably very expensive, much mm -hmm. more expensive than he, if he would have settled. But he won. And for him, his integrity, his you know, being able to tell the world, I didn't steal anything, yeah. was more valuable to him. And maybe Mariah Carey takes that approach. I don't know. Which is where you go... All right. So did he hire a new attorney or did the attorney approach him? It's like an ambulance chaser in the music industry. They're like, hold on, hold on. I know that last guy failed you, but give me a chance. Let me try. And the guy's like, whatever, try whatever you want. Like, I don't know. I will state that we have listeners going, wait, didn't we already do this? Yes, we did. We did this a year ago. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. You know, Last time this happened, like my son wasn't even born yet. And you can tell because in that 2022 clip that we just played, I sounded so youthful. I mean, when I was when I was watching that clip, all I could think was, man, that guy seems so awake. Man, sleeping. So that? few wrinkles on that guy. Yeah, man, that was it was it was a completely different time a year but not ago. Not much has changed. Not much has changed. <laughs> Poor thing. Oh. But this is a troubling trend. I yes. mean, I don't know if it's a legislative solution or if the judges need to change their approach, but we can't have music copyright be this so incredibly uncertain field that you make copyright owners just afraid of being the next big infringement case because that can stifle future creativity. I don't know what the solution is, but I'd like to see some discussions about us having one. How do you get to 50% without like matching lyrics? Like, I feel like if you had all of the lyrics, but none of the music, I could go, okay, that's 50%. Or like all of the music, but none of the lyrics maybe. But like, how do you get to 50% with neither of those? Don't take our word for it, viewers just, and listeners. Like, listen, if you listen. think if you think we're not being fair, I beseech you, pull up your Spotify machine, listen to both of these songs. Give him if the attention you can he find wants. a similarity beyond the title, you have better ears than I. <laughs> oh no! But I mean, okay. it's uh, I mean, like I, I I I'm telling you, like 
it's it's absolutely nuts. All right, well, all right, let's compose ourselves because we got uh, so much great show here. We're gonna take a quick break, you know, just just woosa. There, <laughs> we both said it at the same time. Take a quick break. Then we got Cat Henry from Live Music Society joining us. That's gonna be a great interview. Don't go anywhere. Keep checking out Break the Business. Ryan Corella here. I hope you're enjoying the show, and I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. I do what I do because I care about creators like you. A lot. I've dedicated my career to helping creative professionals, entrepreneurs, and organizations move forward. I do it by hosting this program, and I'm also proud to do it in my legal practice. If you're a creative professional looking for solutions-oriented legal services to help you further your goals, I'd love to help. My firm RKPA does contracts, commercial law, copyright, trademark, and more. Visit rkpalaw.com to learn more. That's rkpalaw.com. Ryan A. Corella, PA, Miami, Florida. Streaming services for Break the Business provided by L.E.K. Entertainment. L.E.K. Entertainment is a full-service entertainment company offering everything from consultations to full-scale events and productions, including audio and video productions, voiceovers, staged theatrical productions, script and music development, and streaming services. For more information, visit lekentertainment.com. L.E.K. Entertainment wants to help you bring your story to life. Thanks for supporting Break the Business. If you have a question or topic that you want us to discuss, email us at breakthebusiness at gmail.com. You can follow the host, that's me, on Twitter at Ryan K-A-I-R, and you can follow the show at The BTB Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and on all major podcast platforms. And now, let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Break the Business, everybody. Ryan Corelli here with producer Lauren. Our thanks to Vivek Jayaram for joining us earlier in the show. Uh, learning about his amazing Taylor Swift course. I'm looking at the complaint in this Vince Vance lawsuit, <laughs> Lauren. And in one part of the complaint, the attorneys for Vince Vance says that there is a lyrical similarity. And boy, is this one of the most impressive use of quotation ellipses I've ever seen. <laughs> he says, there is a, a similar music phrase of, I don't need dot, 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 presence, dot, 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 underneath the christmas tree i was like oh okay both of those songs have that same lyric let me pull up the lyrics for both songs and see how they're used because it sounds like if both of those lines are in there that is similar so That's i look at the that. lyrics all right the the mariah <laughs> carey version that uh that has those words in it is don't care about the presence underneath the christmas tree i don't need to hang my stocking there upon the fireplace so uh, don't care about, uh, I, I don't need is in there and underneath the Christmas tree is technically in there. And then the Vince Vance version is I don't need expensive things. They don't matter to me. All that I want, it can't be found underneath the Christmas tree. So like using some very strategic ellipses and just stretching them as far as they can go. Yes. Technically all of those words are in both of those clips. They both said Christmas tree. Yeah. In a, in a Christmas song. In a Christmas song. song? Oh, about and, gifts <laughs> and the frustrating thing is that i mean it's not that he's even necessarily wrong on the law because with some of these copyright cases that are coming out in the music space like it's at least enough of a claim that he could get a settlement so like i guess i'm i'm not even just as frustrated with this lawyer as i am just frustrated with the current state of the system uh yeah. daniel naruda writes in wait is that what's going on this is about getting people to listen to his song on Spotify. No. I mean, if you're a conspiracy theorist, right, is <laughs> is the idea that Vince Vance is going to sue Mariah Carey every year to make everybody go, hmm, are these songs really similar? Let me stream the Vince Vance song and find out. They um, both get streamed now. I, I don't dabble in conspiracy theories that much, but boy, would it be hilarious if that were true. All right. Anyway. <laughs> To serious matters, we got a amazing guest this week who does really important work. I'm excited to talk to her. She is the executive director of the Live Music Society, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect small venues and listening rooms across the United States. Live Music Society has distributed over $3 million in grant funding to 143 venues since its founding in 2020. You can find out more about our guest work by visiting livemusicsociety.org. We are happy to welcome Kat Henry 
on to break the business. Hi, Kat. Hi. Lovely to be here. Nice to meet both of you. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Lovely you are not to be from Miami. <laughs> <laughs> You sound so much more pleasant. <laughs> it's funny that you were talking about the... That uh, was your first question. <laughs> that wasn't a question. That was a statement. <laughs> Welcome, Kat. Thank you. Yeah, I was listening. It's been very interesting to listen to the conversation up to this point. And, <laughs> and yeah, it's a, a wild way to get to a million streams, perhaps, by doing a million lawsuits. Uh, <laughs> I guess it will be very expensive. <laughs> yapping, the yapping dog strategy, right? But I'm hoping that we can get out of the courtroom and out of the classroom with Vivek and maybe like take a trip into the mosh pit. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that's I where we like want to be you with you, yeah. Kat Henry of Live Music Society. Such important work that you're doing protecting small venues, which are obviously critical to the independent creators that we seek to empower on this show. But don't let me be the one that tells us about it. Can you tell us a little bit, Kat, about the work that your organization does? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, you know, we believe, as I'm sure you do, that music is at the very center of what it means to be alive. And uh, that small venues are still essential building blocks to any creator, musician's career. And in fact, to working musicians, uh, venues are, and touring, are a huge part of how they make their daily bread. You know, it can be 80 to 90% of a musician's income is from touring venues. Uh, we know that these spaces are unique, very eccentric, very diverse from everything from punk DIY, all ages spaces to, you know, venerable jazz venues, supper clubs, and everything in between. And we just love them and we want to highlight how important they are to the music ecosystem. It's where musicians hone their craft, where they connect with their audiences. But on the audience's side, you know, if you can be up close and personal with someone in that genuine, authentic way, uh, I think it beats being, you know, 500 yards away from the jumbotron and and looking at the musician as like a little ant on a stage. So um, yeah, that's basically it. We're all love. We're all love for these places and um, and the, and the people who run them. You know, it's a it's a, a labor of love. The the margins are extremely slim, even before the pandemic. Um, and of course, you know, uh, our board of directors, the founders of Live Music Society, had already in 2019 thought, how do we, how do we ensure that these places stay around when so many are closing? And then, right as Live Music Society was established, the pandemic came along. Oh. And of course, there was an immediate, immediate, urgent need to step in. So, um, yeah, we were luckily we were there. We were there at that time. Well, let's talk about that pivot because that's kind of wild. All right. Imagine, Lauren, okay, yeah. you're starting an organization that's all about protecting small venues and then the live performances. Yeah. And then within a few weeks of your organization starting up, you go, you have this massive epidemiological crisis that shuts down all the live yeah, venues. Like, huh. Can you talk about how your this organization is what we were stopping? So, <laughs> like, how did your organization respond to that? That didn't just involve like screaming and hiding under a pillow. How did you <laughs> pivot your organization to continue to support small venues when they all seemingly were in danger of disappearing? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like, let's just face it: the the live music concert business. It is a huge part of American economy, American culture, uh, just the American um, a, a, uh, influence on the rest of the world is, is, this, uh, is our live music culture. And to lose that and that economic engine um, is, is huge. And it was in danger of completely going away, not just live music, but entertainment in general, live entertainment. And... Um, of course, ultimately, the government recognized that and passed a legislation that that gave uh, emergency funding. But that didn't happen till spring of 2021, summer of 2021. You know, in May of 2020, that was a long way off. Yeah. So um, our board immediately decided that 
we needed to start giving away money as soon as possible. And I had selected the first group of venues to receive emergency funding in October of 2020, long before the government funding came. And of course, there were a lot of other different uh, foundations and, and, ent and city entities also helping. It's amazing how people really rallied around the thing that they value and the value of art and music was really recognized all throughout lockdown. It was what pe got people through, right? Yeah. And, you know, like helped us all deal with loss. So we um, started with emergency funding and we ultimately did three rounds of emergency funding with about two and a half million dollars through um, the summer of 2021 when we knew that the SVOG, the Shuttered Venues Operators Grant, was finally up and running, accepting applications through their enormously complicated system, um, but money was getting into the hands of people. And then we took a pause and we were like, okay, we'll go back to what we originally planned to do and let's think about what it is that we want this organization to be. And along the way, over 100 venues have benefited from your millions of dollars of funding through the Live Music Society. <laughs> I know this would be like asking you to like choose among children in your life or whatever, but can you give us one of your favorite success stories? What is one venue that you help that like really resonates with you? Oh man, you're right. It's, it's very difficult. There's a few stories. It's not necessarily success stories, but impact stories, you know, like there's places that are so central to um, the, the communities that they're embedded in and, and really have become safe spaces. And I use that term uh, in a very broad sense in that, you know, there was, there was a venue that we supported. It's called Flint Local 432. And of course, it is in Flint, Michigan. It's an all age, ages venue. And um, they just give a space, you know, in a place where gun violence is is so high and, and so impactful on, on young people and all of the stuff that Flint went through with the with the water crisis, that there, there's a space that teenagers can go and just let off steam and express themselves. And they actually allow the, the teenagers to run. The, the general manager is, is very young. The people, they're operating everything. And they've got to make a space upstairs now that when microphones break or amps need repairing, they don't just send things up to be repaired. Like they, they show the, the young people, like, this is how you take a microphone apart. This is how you repair this. And so just that symbiotic re relationship that where you can get, it's like when we were kids where you'd have, you know, bicycle repair workshops so that you knew how to change your tires, that kind of thing. It's really, really important. And for a lot of the all ages venues, it's a way, you know, just a great way to get kids out of their bedrooms and, and off scrolling in a, in a time when we have so much uh, mental health crisis that was caused by the pandemic. I love seeing these, these programs that the venues, the venues are doing. And on, that's in Flint. On the other side of the country, I'll just mention another one that is at one of our favorites, uh, the Ivy Room in Albany, California, is run by these amazing women and they are one of the first recipients of our new grant called Music in Action. And they're using that to create a, a festival of music next June for Pride Month that is not only bringing music to the venue, but is going to do job fairs and, and, and workshops and mental health screenings and health screenings. And so we love how much they serve their community. Each, each venue of our grantees and and we're up to about 175 now who have been impacted by our funding um they each have a very unique way of of connecting with their communities or bringing various communities not just one community bringing various communities into their space to to make them feel welcome and um it's it's amazing to see what what they managed to do with very small amounts of money. So <laughs> what, what I'm hearing from you is when somebody asks why support small venues, I mean, 
The two answers that I can come up with are one, because small venues are awesome and the <laughs> art coming out of there is important. And so they're inherently important to support for that reason. But an equally important consideration that you're bringing up in some of your amazing stories there is that to invest in small venues more so than venues of any other size is to invest in communities. And, you know, these particular venues by virtue of their size, by virtue of the fact that individuals interact with them more, that they're nimble enough to, to serve their outside communities. These venues are particularly well poised to when they get support, they can then quickly bring that support out into the surrounding community and have an immediate positive impact as you showed in those stories, which were incredible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's not just nonprofits. You know, people expect that not for profit um, venues and music organizations have education programs, which they do, um, and, and are very much community service oriented. But even the for profit places, they do, they do fundraisers for their local other nonprofits. They, they make their space available during the day for um, community gatherings and, and yeah, so our our new grant uh, our program, Music in Action, really recognizes that. It's about audience development, community engagement, making uh, a, that connection that will ensure the long-term health and growth of your venue. You know, you can't do it without that support of fans, visitors, musicians, the staff who work there. It is an, a little microcosm of humanity. Um, that makes that makes these places, you know, something more than just four walls and a stage. Yeah. Cultural experiences for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah. let's let's so we, we talked a little bit about what your organization has done and some of the great achievements. But I, I want to take us to the here and now, because and mm -hmm. sort of like what I think is kind of a big, exciting project you all are up to right now. Back in September, your organization announced a partnership with the International Music Residency, the House of Songs, to bring that program back to Austin. And this has been met with a lot of fanfare. A lot of people are happy to hear this. Can you talk more about that collaboration? Yeah, the House of Songs was founded in Austin, and it is a, a music incubator. It partners songwriters from around the world with songwriters from Austin, and they had been there um, right until the pandemic, but they just couldn't make it work. Uh, and they moved to Bentonville, Arkansas. They managed to keep their programs running. They got a, a really great grant from the Walton Family Foundation, which allowed them to keep going for a while. But Austin has been their home. Uh, Troy Graham, who founded it, uh, is a great musician himself. And, you know, we got to know what they were doing. And this is a kind of a new direction for the society of looking not just at venue owners and operators, but kind of incubators where the emerging artists and the songwriters um, are supported elsewhere before they get before they get to the venue. So we're looking forward to, to trying to look at how how we might collaborate on their residencies they have a, an amazing residency program and to do some to do some performances together that get the songwriters out into uh performance stuff and we're, we're looking at doing some other things with incubators uh around the country it's a it's a really interesting form of nurturing young artists not just giving them a gig but showing them how to create an epk figuring out how to do their social media, teaching them about contracts, you know, like teaching them about copyright law, teaching them about just the law, um, which it's, you know, sometimes it's very uh, deep woods for, for young musicians uh, new to the field to, to navigate. It seems like a great natural extension for the work that your amazing organization is already doing, right? You've you've devoted the last few years to giving creative professionals a place to play, and now you want to be more holistic. You want to give them the resources that they need to thrive. And I think an incubator, accelerator kind of model for creative professionals where they can learn the business stuff, they can learn how to build their organizations, they can learn the legal skills that they need to protect themselves while you're also giving them a place to play by supporting these small venues. 
uh, just makes perfect sense to me. And obviously, considering the mission of this program, uh, we're definitely aligned there. So <laughs> cool. Yeah, How? and it's a network. It's an amazing network. You know, 170 venues. They're all over the place. Many of them don't know each other. We've, in our conversations with each of them, see similarities and commonalities that make us want to bring them together. Um, for example, there's um, venues in Denver and San Francisco and Northampton, Massachusetts, who all were exploring the idea of becoming not-for-profits to move away from the for-profit model and become not-for-profits, but it's a daunting task. And so we connected them as they were exploring how does how does that happen? What do you have to do? Um, do you have uh, stories to share about how you do it? So networking, building the network and, and sharing best practices and just knowledge and expertise and sob stories in some cases is, uh, is, is one of the next steps for us as well. I'm stealing Ryan's questions now, but how, how can you uh, become a part of that? If you have a venue and you're looking for help or wanting to get to be a part of some of those networks you're creating, how can we get to you? <laughs> well, uh, people can reach out to us through our website, of course, and there's lots and lots of information. There's all the grantees. Um, we're looking... We. Our network uh, initially, of course, are our grantees. Those are the venues that we've created relationships with. And when we say small venues, we're generally talking about venues under 300 capacity and under. Once you're above 300, we think small mid-sized venue. Um, even though a 500, 600 cap venue has a many of the same economic and uh, and legal hurdles that that smaller venues need to to jump over and and especially in the situation that we have now with inflation impacting fixed costs like insurance and licenses it's you know it's it continues and will probably never stop being a tough tough world to go into but yeah, people can reach out to us through info at livemusicsociety.org we are in the middle of a current grant round and we will be another announcing another grant round that we're opening in January. And so we'll be, you know, putting a press release out in December. Uh, we have two major grant programs. This is the first year we did a pivot away from emergency funding into something, of course, like more optimistic, you know, it's time <laughs> people needed to look ahead and like, I wouldn't say, you know, it's, there was a there was a set time when we all said, hey, the pandemic's over now, because it has a long tail. You know, a lot yeah. COVID put a lot of venues in a big financial hole that they're still crawling out of slowly. And that's the same for a lot of small businesses. But to be able to look at something more hopeful, more optimistic, more positive, that you know you can that you can get some excitement around, uh, whether it's a music festival or an education program or um, all the kinds of different things that we're funding. That's what we wanted to do. So we have two signature programs now. Music in Action is up to fifty thousand dollars for a big. Uh, community engagement project, audience development project. People get their thinking caps on and they say, what have I always wanted to do that I don't have the seed money to try and, um, and bring us their creative ideas. And then currently we are adjudicating uh, a, a, a new grant called Toolbox. We're calling this Toolbox. It's practical help for the needs of venues because as they're recovering and trying to get financially stable, they don't have the extra funds to make these improvements, to do these things that are often desperately needed, like fixing your wiring or, or you know, things that you're mandated to do by the fire department, potentially. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the bandwidth to do them. So our toolbox grant helps um, venues with that up to $10,000. Uh, so those are going to be our grant programs that will be annual and our next Music in Action grant will be announced in, uh, will be opening in, in January and, and then we'll be starting to do the networking. So we want to hear about new venues. Yeah. 
We want to hear about nonprofits, for profits. We're one of the only organizations, I think, that give money to for profits as well as nonprofits. So anybody listening can go to our website, write to write, they can write to me, cat at livemusicsociety.org. I'm always happy to hear from venue owners, artists, anybody who wants to reach out to us. Um, and spread the word about, you know, how wonderful these places are and how essential they are and um, how wacky and, and <laughs> beautiful and yeah. cool it is to run one. Our I'll listeners get- agree with you. I'm just, uh, we got a note from one of our listeners asking, uh, it says, now I want to work for Live Music Society. <laughs> so uh, you might be getting inquiries uh, on people yeah. who want to join your mission as well. Absolutely. Like- we, you know, I've, I've received a lot of support and people, you know, we're, we're fairly new. We've only been going for a, a few years, but we're building our own capacity and, and looking at how we can leverage just the passion that's out there, you know, for people. I'm sure I'm going to ask you a question. You have a memory of something when you were younger that occurred in a small music venue because most of us do most people who are into live music have a memory of something that they did like i i stayed up all night queuing for tickets for david bowie when i was when i was 16 years old and i remember being in the mosh pit at the marquee club in london you know during the late 80s punk punk era um just really incredible memories that are, are created in these spaces yeah That's absolutely right. Our guest has been Kat Henry. She's the executive director of the Live Music Society. Visit info at uh, info.livemusicsociety.org to find out more about this amazing organization and its incredible mission. Kat, we got just a little bit of time left, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you our final question. Do you have any last tips for the indie creators out there to help them move their careers forward? I think the tip that I would have is is create relationships. You know, if you whatever your local space is, you know, they're they're willing to give you a chance. You know, be bold, be bold to to go and practice and and see and see if if you can have that chance to perform. Um, because you know everybody thinks TikTok's going to be the the place that new new creators are found, but without those skills, there's people who blew up on TikTok and then they get in front of an audience and they they don't really know what to do. So just any any um, chances to perform live is uh, a way of improving not your craft, but you just your whole life, your whole outlook on life is it's it's important to get out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Our thanks to Kat Henry, to Professor Vivek Jairam. Thanks to you as always, Producer Lauren. And thanks to all of our viewers and listeners for checking out Break the Business. We had a blast and we'll see you next week. 